In America, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, and atheists all coexist together. In places like Ireland, where I'm from, the vast majority of people are either Catholic or Protestant. There are other religious groups, but they're a vanishing minority. However, here in America, there are hundreds, if not thousands of religions. But amongst this anarchic free market of religion, there's peace. But before the founding of America, this peace was deemed to be a fantasy or wishful thinking at best. How could one possibly live alongside and cooperate with people who you disagree about life's greatest questions, creation, heaven, and God? Even if somehow we didn't all kill each other, how are religious people meant to stick to their faith while other people wave alternatives in their face and argue about the very foundations of their belief? America today shows that religious freedom is not only possible, but preferable to any alternative. One could even say freedom of religion is, in fact, the only true way to salvation. But in history, there are a few examples of the pervasive freedom we experience today. Before, and to some extent even during the Enlightenment, European rulers, when bold enough and of a pious enough mind, have often assumed the supremacy of their ideas of religion. So much so that they believed they had a right to force others not only to follow their rules and customs, but to compel them to believe in their preferred divine truths. Naturally, this has led to countless conflicts, pogroms and subjugations, especially throughout the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, where Europe was the battleground for numerous wars between Catholics and Protestants. As Europe was engulfed by violence, some imagined a world where Catholics and Protestants could set aside the differences and live in peace. But even so, often Enlightenment doctrines of religious freedom were actually quite limited. Even John Locke, a hero of liberalism, theorized the limits of how much religious liberty ought to exist. Locke secured religious toleration amongst varying sects of Protestants, but atheists and Catholics he believed were untrustworthy, since atheists could not supposedly make a binding promise without God, and Catholics worshipped the Pope over God, according to Locke. Though Locke might be famous for his letter concerning toleration, today I'll be arguing, on the topic of freedom of religion, there is a much greater authority, the 17th century Roger Williams, a staunchly religious and pious Puritan minister and theologian, who dedicated his life fighting for the right of every single person to live according to their conscience and follow their path of salvation, whether they be Christians, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, or even, God forbid, atheists. And unless you're from Rhode Island, the name Roger Williams might not be a familiar one. Roger Williams is often relegated to obscurity in favor of Enlightenment thinkers that came after his time. But today, I hope to convince you that he was not just the founder of Rhode Island, but the founder of a way of life that would make America truly great. We don't know exactly when Roger Williams was born, but historians tend to agree it was sometime around 1603 in Smithfield, London. Williams' father, James Williams, was a tailor in Smithfield. He grew up not poverty-stricken, with humble origins. Growing up in Smithfield, there was a place nearby where heretics were burned alive. The young Williams likely witnessed these horrors. Before Williams was born, England had a bit Catholic nation. However, in 1534, Henry VIII broke ties with the Catholic Church and declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England. After a brief reign from Henry's successor, Queen Mary I took charge and made it her mission to restore Catholicism to England. During her reign, nearly 300 Protestants were burned at the stake. After Mary, the famous Queen Elizabeth took the throne, and unlike her predecessors, she attempted to balance the interests of her subjects. During this time, Calvinists came together and began advocating to purge the church of its remaining Catholic features, such as priestly hierarchies. Their opponents often labeled them as Puritans, because they wanted to purify. When Elizabeth died in 1603, Puritans were optimistic about the new King James, and believed reform was imminent. Though tolerant at first, James loathed the stubbornness of the Puritans and their constant plea for reform. In the final years of his reign, James began officially persecuting the Puritans and enforcing religious conformity. Though not born into a Puritan family, the backdrop of William's childhood was an environment hostile to any form of dissent. Roughly at about the age of 12, while attending his parish, Williams was spotted vigorously taking notes in a sermon by the legal giant Edward Coke, one of the great champions of common law. Impressed by the young lad, Coke took on Williams as a scribe for his work at the infamous Star Chamber, where heretics, dissenters, and anyone who threatened the status quo was hauled in front of judges with unfettered power 
to deal out horrific punishments. If Williams somehow did not see persecution in action before, now he had front row seats. For his work, by 1624, Coke sponsored Williams' higher education to become a minister, an opportunity that would have eluded him without his help. Williams was educated at Cambridge, where he encountered professors of Puritan ideals. And upon graduating in 1629, Williams served as a chaplain for William Masham in Essex, a Puritan sympathizer. Though we cannot be 100% sure, by now Williams had probably converted to Calvinism. While serving as a chaplain, Williams met a maidservant, Mary Bernard, the daughter of a clergyman. In December of 1629, the couple were married in the Church of High Laver, where John Locke is buried. Though happily married, the couple began to worry. King James was dead, yes, but his son Charles I followed in his footsteps of enforcing religious conformity. Puritans had hoped to see some sort of reform in the Church of England, but this seemed like an increasingly unlikely event with Charles on the throne. Puritans put a great deal of value on their conscience, but something had to change in England with the noose tightening. Conformity violated their conscience and made it so they wouldn't have a place in the afterlife. This wasn't a matter of life and death, it was a matter of heaven and hell. But an opportunity arose. As England began to explore the new world of America, a new idea came. Puritans didn't have to reform the church. They could leave and establish their own, far, far away from spiritual tyranny. So in 1629, Puritan leaders met at Lincolnshire to discuss this bold idea with Williams in attendance. And a year later, at the port of Bristol, alongside his wife Mary and 20 other Puritans, Williams boarded a ship named Lion and set sail for the New World, hoping to reach Massachusetts. As Williams stared out at the ocean, he probably daydreamed of a place without inquisitions or tyrannical kings, where Williams and his fellow Puritans could freely worship without compromising their consciences. In 1631, Williams landed at Nantasket, close to Boston. At first, things went great for him. He was warmly received by the governor, John Winthrop, who welcomed him as a godly minister. He was impressed by his integrity and the leaders of Boston Church offered Williams a position as an assistant pastor, kind of a teacher. And Boston's church was most prominent in the colony. This is a pretty good deal for Williams. But, weirdly enough, Williams turned down the position. His reasoning? The Boston church had not yet renounced the Church of England. Puritans possessed a shared distaste for the Catholic elements of the Church of England. However, many considered themselves to be part of England's official church, and aimed for reform, not revolution. But other Puritans like Williams believed the cruel reality was that any notions of reform would be quickly quashed. The solution was to establish their own congregations without hierarchies and free from central control. People like Williams were known as separatists. Many leaders of the colonies believed this was too radical of a position and they need to stay in the good graces of people in power in England. After publicly advocating for separatism, Williams and his wife traveled to the town of Salem, where he found a separatist congregation more suited to his views. As time wore on, Williams began to doubt the commitment of his congregation to separatism. He decided to move 30 miles south to the colony of Plymouth, a bunch more dedicated to cutting ties with the Church of England. But even here, Williams eventually left after two years, but for not entirely clear reasons. The Plymouth governor, William Brewster, said that Williams had fallen into strange opinions, but what those opinions exactly were is kind of unclear. While at Plymouth, Williams had no congregation, so he had to find a new way to support his family. To earn a living, he established a trading post with the local Native American tribes. And while interacting with the natives, Williams learned about their customs and languages, in his own words, with a constant and zealous desire. He developed what would become a lifelong admiration for the natives. And unlike many of his fellow colonists, Williams considered them to be moral beings worthy of respect and dignity. Williams returned back to Salem in 1634 as a pastor and launched himself into the religious debates of the day over issues that might seem a little bizarre to us, like should women wear veils when they're praying? But what really landed Williams in hot water with the authorities was his opinion on the natives. If you listen to my previous episode on Bartolomeo de las Casas, you'll be aware that most Europeans had quite a shallow assessment of the Native Americans. They mostly regarded them to be barbaric and uncivilized. But Williams knew this wasn't true, he had traded and conversed with the natives, and endeavoured to understand and cooperate with them more than most. Williams questioned the legal status of the land given by King Charles to the Bay Colony. Williams explained that previously the land had belonged to the natives. The king, no matter how mighty, 
was not to commit, as he says, a sin of unjust usurpation upon others' possessions. Now, some back in Europe might say, well, he's a Christian. But that didn't matter to Williams. He argued that kings being Christian did not give them special rights to take the possessions of non-believers. What Williams said was dangerously close to treason, as he had questioned the will of the king. Though Williams' pamphlet was suppressed, he eventually evaded legal charges. For now. Maybe it's a virtue and a vice, but Williams was always willing to argue his point, for better or worse. Even if it was deeply unpopular with his fellow colonists. He protested against the Bayes colony requirements that all males over 16 had to swear an oath to both the colony and crown. This oath alone was fine, however, the oath ended with, so help me God. For Williams, any oath taken under the name of God was, in essence, a kind of prayer, and to compel anyone to pray in a particular manner violated the conscience of both believers and even non-believers alike. It's really rare that someone in this time period would even take into account the feelings of non-believers or what they want. That's how open-minded he was. Already suspicious of Williams and his views, the leadership of Massachusetts had their fears confirmed in 1635, when Williams began to argue that civil authority, or in simpler terms, the state, had no authority in the interlinked realms of religion and conscience. The power of the state only extends over the bodies and goods of citizens, not their hearts or minds. At a time when the vast majority of Europeans believe that the state ought to support religion, Williams, on the other hand, viewed them as two distinct and separate entities with different ends. The state secures safety and prosperity on this earth, while religion is about procuring a place in heaven. The General Court of Massachusetts began to survey Williams and constantly summoned him to espouse his possibly dangerous use for assessment. The General Court began to apply pressure on Williams, by withholding the town of Salem's request for more land until Williams was ousted. As the people of Salem slowly started to turn against Williams, his views solidified. Though the General Court offered him a chance to recant, he refused. Fearing him to be a dangerous mind, in 1635, the General Court voted to convict him of sedition and heresy, punishing Williams by banishing him for supposedly diverse, new, and dangerous opinions. Though brave, Williams was in quite the tough spot. He had a wife and child to support, with another one on the way. One option was a turn to England, but if his opinions caused banishment in Massachusetts, they would cause his execution in England. Though Williams was given six weeks to vacate, his presence was nerve-inducing. The general court decided that Williams ought to be forced onto a ship back home as quick as possible. But Williams caught wind of this plan, and when the authorities visited his home, he'd seemingly vanished without a trace. Braving what he called the howling wilderness, Williams spent a grueling 14 weeks trudging through the bitter cold. Though kicked out by his supposed Christian brethren, Williams was sheltered and aided by the natives, who had great respect for him, a rare white man who did not view them as savages and tried to actually understand them. Williams, unlike most of his predecessors, actually purchased land from the natives, controversially without any sort of formal recognition from the king back in England. Showing the depth of Williams' friendship, a native sachem, Canonicus, didn't take money from Williams and instead accepted gifts instead over the course of his life. Before dying, Canonicus asked to be buried with some of the gifts he had received from Williams. And the feeling was not one-sided at all. Williams explained that, when the hearts of my countrymen and friends failed me, Canonicus was the one who showed real Christian charity, despite never reading scripture. After finding a decent spot, Williams built a shelter. By 1637, his wife and children, followed by friends and neighbours, joined Williams. While the new settlers planted seeds in the way of their harvests, the natives offered food to weary settlers. A year before Williams' family's arrival, an English trader was killed, and John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts, believed the Narragansetts were responsible. Williams, a longtime friend of this tribe, interceded and convinced Winthrop that this was not the case. However, now the blame was shifted to another tribe, the Pequots, as the people of Massachusetts prepared for war. Williams intervened again and persuaded the Narragansetts to join the fight against the Pequots. Though the Narragansett tribe avoided the war, the Pequots were attacked and subsequently slaughtered, with any survivors being rounded up and sold into slavery. So Williams established his new colony, Providence, and as it grew in size, Williams ordered that no man should be molested for his conscience. Providence, or as it would later be called, Rhode Island, became a safe haven for those fleeing religious persecution. Though 
Williams had established Providence confidently. It was kind of a house of cards. The town had no legal backing from the king or parliament or even Massachusetts. Williams dreamed religious freedom could collapse without the right kind of legal backing. Still exiled from Massachusetts, Williams was forced to take the longer route setting sail from New Amsterdam, now New York, to England. He set sail in the summer of 1643. Though Williams' main goal was to secure a charter for the colony, he also wished to print and publish some of his works while in London. Williams arrived to see England engulfed in a brutal civil war between king and parliament. Though it seemed unlikely that he would garner much attention at all for a tiny settlement across the world, Williams' Puritan friends were now in positions of power. Normally, charters were granted by a king, but as Parliament was at war with said king, through some good old-fashioned politicking, Williams secured a charter from Parliament instead. Importantly, the government in Williams' charter was one strictly limited to the civil sphere, and religious freedom was not to be impinged upon. Continental Europeans were perplexed by the stories of Native Americans, and they were hungry for more information. And thanks to his extensive experience among the natives, Williams published his first and most popular book, Key into the Language of America, a valuable resource of cultural anthropology. The English, and Europeans in general, thought of themselves as more civilized, more cultured than the savage natives. Williams endeavored to disprove this by showing the breadth and value of native culture. Williams point out that natives had tons of different expressions and words for hospitality and would often share anything they could to help others, whether a friend or a stranger. Williams could personally attest to this fact as he was saved by them. Unlike the mental caricature that May English had of the natives as wild and violent savages, Williams countered this, writing, There is a savour of civility and courtesy even among these wild Americans, both amongst themselves and towards strangers. Williams affirmed that the natives were not some sort of subspecies of humanity, as it was often thought, but part of it. He explained that, Nature knows no difference between Europeans and Americans' blood, birth, bodies, etc. God, having of one blood, made mankind. One of his lovely poetic expressions reads, Boast not proud English of thy birth and blood, thy Indian brother is by birth as good. This meant that just like any other people, the natives have a right to religious freedom, a right that has often been trampled on by what Williams called monstrous and most inhumane conversions. Also while in London, Williams published another book with a ridiculously lengthy title, which is The Bloody Tenant of Persecution for a Cause of Conscience Discussed in a Conference Between Truth and Peace Who in Tender Affection Present the High Court of Parliament as a Result of Their Discourse, These Amongst Other Passages of Highest Consideration, Mercifully Known as Simply the Bloody Tenant of Persecution. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, so I'm just going to call it Bloody Tenant. So the Bloody Tenant was a response to John Cotton, a leading minister back in Boston, who argued against radical religious freedom and the separation of church and state that Williams advocated so heartily for. Unlike Cotton, who argued for moral and religious conformity on a Puritan basis, William rejects the idea that people who wield the state's power should really any say in religious matters. Even if one's preferred religion was the majority in power, Williams argued that persecution inflicts far more damage to the church than religious freedom ever could. The advocates of persecution argued enforcing orthodoxy would have stability. Williams pointed out that the obvious elephant in the room was the numerous religious wars across Europe, what he called the lamentable experience of former and present slaughters. Williams makes the case that true civility and Christianity may flourish in a state or kingdom, notwithstanding the permission of divers and contrary consciences. Basically, we can coexist. Williams made three core arguments relating to theology, politics, and practicality. On a theological level, persecution was an insult to Jesus Christ, who spread Christianity not by the end of a sword, but through persuasion, understanding, and love. Williams believed that Christianity was at its best and most purest form when it was a minority under the Romans. But once Emperor Constantine made the church tool of the Roman Empire, as Williams states, Christianity fell asleep in Constantine's bosom. The lesson of the story? Religion like many other things in life, flourishes when coercion is absent. On the political level, Williams argued that a peaceful and civil society could exist without religious orthodoxy. God has endowed all humans with a sense of morality that allows for peaceful coexistence, regardless of religion. After all, Williams had observed himself, the natives, their innate moral sense, despite lacking any Christian teachings. But even if Williams was wrong about the political and theological arguments, he was resolute that 
just practically speaking, forcing people to believe simply doesn't really work at all. Persecution creates more violence than dissidents ever could. After all, in England, the persecution of the Puritans pushed many in the direction of civil war. But on a more fundamental level, faith is about persuasion. For example, I may be able to, with a gang of goons, beat up anyone who doesn't believe in my faith. But after the brawl, my victims' bodies might be battered, but their minds stand firm. Punching someone in the face does not change their fundamental beliefs. Very surprising, I know. After publishing his books and receiving his charter, in 1644, William set sail to return to his people, Providence. Williams was welcomed with open arms. Because of his consistent dedication and sacrifice, Williams was elected as Chief Officer of Rhode Island. He helped the tiny colony grow more, as people with what he called distressed consciences came to live and worship without having to check over their shoulders for the Inquisition. Until 1647, Williams served tirelessly as Chief Officer, uniting the disparate settlements around the bay into a cohesive whole. When the four small towns that Williams had founded united, they became the colony of Rhode Island and Providence. By November of 1651, Williams set sail alongside John Clark back to England in an attempt to secure a more permanent charter. But England was in great turmoil following the Civil War, and after publishing more books and doing the best he could, three years abroad proved too much. Weary, Williams returned home, leaving Clark in charge of attaining the charter, which would take a lengthy ten years. Despite this long wait, the charter would affirm the idea of religious freedom that Williams had spent his life fighting for. A line of the charter reads, A most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained with a full liberty and religious concernments. It was music to William's ears, who finally achieved his goal of religious freedom for all. But when Williams returned to Rhode Island initially, he found the town fallen into disunity, and frustrated by his fellow Rhode Islanders' short-sightedness, he wrote a famous letter to the town of Providence, which contributed greatly towards his election as president, a position he held for three years before beginning his slow retreat from public life. But sadly, before he could retire in leisure, Williams was heartbroken when King Philip's War broke out in 1675 between the expansionist colonists and concerned native tribes, many of whom Williams had been close allies with before. Despite being 70 years old, Williams was reluctantly elected as captain of Providence's militia force. After a storied life of adventure, exile, and triumph, Williams died at Providence in early 1683, after a long, and I say selfless life. We don't know exactly when Roger Williams was born, or even what he looked like. During his life, there wasn't a single monument erected to him, and even his grave lacks a headstone. But does that mean that Williams left no legacy? I don't think so. His life was a testament to proving that people who fundamentally disagree with each other could still come together and cooperate for the greater good. States like New Jersey and Carolina adopted charters that endorsed religious freedom along very similar lines that Williams advocated for. Though Williams is often forgotten, this is probably because the revolutionary superstars that would emerge from the American Revolution overshadowed his legacy. But before James Madison or Thomas Jefferson ever put pen to paper to defend religious freedom, Williams had shown in practice the result was not anarchy. While Williams quickly faded from public memory, he still had his admirers. For example, the 18th century historian Isaac Bacchus wrote, they knew of no one else during his period who acted so consistently and steadily upon right principles about government and liberty as Mr. Williams did. The separation of church and state, freedom of religion, and a broad culture of tolerance today are the gifts that Roger Williams helped create that now form a core part of the American identity. Looking around today in America, we live in a world shaped by a moral vision of people like Williams. But at times, the virtues of tolerance and patience he practiced seem to be in short supply in our current political landscape. Many of the pilgrims and Puritans who came to America only wanted liberty for themselves. Williams, on the other hand, wanted to share the gift of liberty with humanity as a whole whether the recipient was a Quaker, an atheist, a Buddhist, whatever. The bottom line for Williams was, all humans have rights, and these rights begin with the right to think for yourself without being forced for your own supposed good to conform. Francis Whelan, the president of Brown University during the 19th century, said of Williams, there are some men whose monuments are everywhere. I think America's religious pluralism today is a monument to people like Roger Williams, who wouldn't settle for freedom unless it was experienced by all.
Thanks a mil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.